We do worship the Lord's holy name today. It is so good to see you. First of all, let me give you a little praise report. Thank you so much for your prayers. Many of you knew that I'd gone down to Central America this week to meet with pastors in Belize. Down there for two basic reasons. One is our mission trip in June is to Belize. And we're making hotel arrangements and trying to start a bidding war between some hotels and restaurants. And uh, trying to get that down to even more than what we've done before. So we can be wise stewards of what the Lord has given us. Try to make it as affordable as possible for people to go. Uh, the second reason was to meet with the pastors in Belmapan about that event that will take place there. Uh, trying to get as many churches involved. In fact, it was a, it's a Baptist meeting originally and meeting with the Baptist pastors there. Uh, about 15 minutes of the meeting, they started really getting the, the vision and the passion for it and kind of stopped abruptly and says, you know, we need to conclude this meeting later because we've got some calls to make. We want to involve some other churches. We want to make this, uh, you know, interdenominational kind of crusade event for the whole city, uh, to which I said, no, we can't do that. No. <laughs> Said, yeah, amen, let's get it done. That night we were invited to a meeting, come talk to some people from the radio station, TV station, some other churches in there. So we're able to plant some seeds there. They're going to be meeting, trying to gather all the, the, the pastors together uh, in just about a week and a half. So we'll be praying for that meeting where they'll talk to them. And then I'll go back in April and we go for our pastor's conference and I'm, I'll go a day early and meet with them so we can kind of put all the final pieces together to, it, to get the whole city involved in that crusade. If we can do it, that'll be great. We all, if we can do it, we're going to need more of you to pack your bags and come along with us. I think we have about 40 people maybe signed up. I know Crystal's not here today. She's out vacating the premises. But uh, I think we're around 40. We have reserved, I believe, 50 seats with United Airlines. So there are some seats available. If you want to come be a part of this trip with us, uh, you know, get a hold of us this week sometime, and I'll, I'll give you more of the details about it. But uh, there, there's some space, and the seat prices are locked in with the airlines. After that, you can still go, but the prices go up because the airfare goes up daily. All right? They sell so many seats at that price, and the next day, they're a different price, and they sell those, and the next day, they're a different price. So, so goes the uh, commercial airline business. One day, we'll just get our own big, giant airline. We'll all go. Amen? So, via Rapture Airlines, most likely. But I do appreciate your prayers. It was a very successful meeting. We also laid out and coordinated the plans for our conference with the pastors. This will be our 11th year. We've done 10 years of conferences with the pastors in Belize. Our, our church has sponsored those conferences completely this year. Amen? It is the most attended conference among pastors in Belize. I mean, uh, one of the main complaints I get from the executive leadership there is that, you know, uh, all the pastors come to the conference. We can't get them to come to our meetings. Uh, so I said, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> what do you say? So I said, we're going to do everything we can to help you with that. So we extended the conference one day, and we're giving them a session to use for their business there to, in, in, as a part of that session. So we've made it longer. A couple more churches are signing on this year to help us out. James Darby's church. I know James, he's been with us on different occasions. His church is coming in, and a church out of Louisiana is going to come in and see if they want to become more committed to that 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 ongoing conference. So your prayers are so appreciated. It was a very fruitful trip. Amen. And I heard it almost snowed while I was gone. It got hot where I was. It got up to like 78. I was really suffering and praying for y'all. It was terrible weather. Hey, well, they were actually wearing sweaters in Belize, Central America. It got in like 69 one morning. So, you know, that's cold weather for, for those guys. They're not quite used to that. Today we're taking some time to set aside just to celebrate and remember the Lord Jesus and a sacrifice for our sins. For those of you who've been around Believer's Fellowship for any length of time, you know that when we come to this event and to this is on the schedule of the church, uh, it's all about the Lord's Supper. I know in some churches, and this is their business, I'm just commenting, that uh, it's kind of tacked on at every service. I feel that we somehow lose it, you know, the significance when we do that every service. And then there's some who celebrate it on a certain schedule every fifth week, whatever, go down, they have a schedule for it, and it's all set up. Uh, we celebrate the Lord's Supper as the Lord gives us direction in that. And it may be three or four times a year. Most churches will, will do that at least. And, uh, but really want to make the whole service. We've been in a very detailed study in the book of James. We're setting that aside today even as we, as we get into this particular service. It's all about remembering the Lord Jesus and what he's done for us. You know, and each time we do the Lord's Supper, the message and what we share prior to the Lord's Supper is unique to this meal. To look at some aspect or several aspects of the significance that it has in our lives and what it means to us. 
try to take some choice nuggets out of the scripture and just share those particular things with you to encourage you that as you take the Lord's Supper, you do it with a, a heart that's fully open to whatever Jesus might say to you and that is fully cognizant, remembering, uh, bringing into focus all that the Lord Jesus has done in the past in regard to his sacrifice for our sins, but all that the Lord's doing in your life today. And I don't know when the last time you took communion was and shared in the Lord's Supper with, with a fellowship before, but we pray today that you'll really give your whole heart over to hearing what God would have to say to you today. Now, we are not a church that has uh, what you call closed communion. If you're a believer in Christ, uh, you're the judge at that point whether you take the Lord's Supper or not. The scripture says that every man should judge himself. If, am I right with God? And if I'm right with God, then I should celebrate this time and remember what the Lord Jesus has done for me. So if you're a guest of ours today, we encourage you to join with us as we, in a moment, we'll share the Lord's Supper together. But there's some things that I think are important we can draw to Scripture. Sometimes we lack to see the significance of what's going on. We're, we're like the little girl that came in from Children's Church one Sunday. She got to come to Big Church. And she's sitting in big church with her mother. And it happened to be one of those Sundays when they were celebrating communion, taking the Lord's Supper together. As they handed out the elements, the bread and the little cup of wine, the little girl looked up at her mom and says, Mom, I hate to tell you this, but in children's church, the snacks are a lot bigger. <laughs> and the juice, you get a lot more of it. So, you know, I've been so chinchy in adult church. Therein is the case what I'm talking about. We failed to see the significance and the real meaning of the Lord Jesus and what he's done for us in his death and burial and resurrection. So I want to talk about the testimony, a little bit of the Lord's Supper. Where's my little uh, weather channel, I call it? So, see if we can get these things working today. In Matthew 26 will be our passage, and we'll look at about four or five verses of Matthew 26 uh, through 30. It says, in, in Scripture, let me read it from the back wall for all of us to read, be reading from the same passage that way. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body. Verse 27, when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, let me go back to that, excuse me, I pushed the button too soon. Boom. Put it back there for me, thank you very much. <laughs> but I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And then verse 30 goes on to say, and they went out and they sang a hymn together. There's three things I briefly want to bring out this morning before we receive the Lord's Supper together. Significant points, I believe, that we need to always have cognizant, always before us. One, as we remember and look at the Lord's Supper, it testifies of the necessity of Christ's death. Scriptures tell us in Hebrews chapter 9, I'm going to put this up from the Amplified Bible. It says, in fact, under the law, almost everything is purified by the means of blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is neither release from the sin and its guilt and the remission of the due and merited punishment for sins. In other words, without the blood, you pay the price for sins. Now, the scripture makes it clear that how many people have sinned? All. For one, by one man's disobedience, all men became sinners, all right? Now, lest you should think, well, that was Adam's fault, all right? You know, before you should become a little bit arrogant at that point, for by one man's sin, put yourself in the same situation, I'm betting all my money you do the same thing. It's by your sin. In fact, it's for your sin as well as Adam's sin that the blood of Jesus Christ was shed. And without that blood, there is no forgiveness of our sins. None whatsoever. It's, it's, let's just say, you know, I had a moment of, uh, of uh, madness and I decided, you know, I think I can help the, uh, the, the church out by raising some extra funds. I'm going to take my nine millimeter Glock and I'm going to go down to the bank and rob it. It's for the Lord, right? <laughs> and I go down to the bank and, I've, you know, I kind of get about $55,000 from the tellers before you know, everything goes off. And I jump in my car and I run off and not too far down the road, at least at my house, the police are waiting. No, you just can't get away from the videos that have shown me walking into the bank and robbing it. I finally tell the police officer, you're right, here's all the money. I hadn't had time to spend any of it. I give it all back. I'm wrong. I, I, I know you have me on video. And they take me to the court. I appear before the judge. How do you plead? They ask me in court. I'm guilty. I mean, it's obvious I'm guilty. You caught me with the money. You've got it on video. It's obvious that I'm the guy who robbed the bank, all right? I'm guilty. The judge sentences me at this point. 
whatever you get for $55,000, I'll be about a week or two now these days. So. <laughs> five years, the gavel goes down. Five years in jail, no probation, no release, no early release. I raise my hand sheepishly and timidly and say, Your Honor. And he says, Yes. I said, Can I say one thing? Yes. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to do it. I was out of my mind. I did it. I know I did it. It's on video. I'm guilty. You caught me. But, you know, I, I was going to do it for a good cause. I had a good reason to do it, I, but I know I, I did it and it's against the law. But is there any way, anyway, I am a good guy and I've done a lot of good stuff. Is there any way that you can let me off? No prison. Mr. Arms, the law is in place for a reason, says the judge. If I let you off, then everybody gets off. There has to be a standard of justice. You're going to jail. You will not collect $200. You will not pass go. You're going to go directly to jail. And I go to serve my sentence. Because he's right. You know, let me go, you've got to let everybody else go. There's a new standard, which is no standard. Well, there is a standard of righteousness that is far beyond the, 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 the understanding of human minds, and it's the justice of God. One thing you learn from Scripture is that God is just. Now, here's the problem. God is just. Man is sin. So God's justice plus man's sin equals God's judgment upon that sin, eternal death. Wages of sin is death. The penalty for sin, according to the law of God, is death. Dying is eternal death. It's a place in hell. That's just the way it is. But, Look at a different equation. If we had God's justice equal, plus man's sin equals eternal death and judgment, righteous judgment, then let's look at it a different way in which God moves in his mercy and grace. And now we have God's judgment, which is right and always true, plus man's sin, all of sin, plus God's love, that equals eternal life. God's love was demonstrated at the cross. Your sin had to be paid for. My sin had to be paid for. Because God is just. And so Jesus comes, in steps Christ, the Lamb of glory, the Lamb of God, who is John the Baptist said, who takes away the sins of the world. And so now we have a new equation. God's judgment. He doesn't change his justice. God's justice plus man's sin plus God's love now equals eternal life. That's the grace of God. But yet, you know, at the same time, that grace of God has to be received and has to be accepted. The Bible says that Christ Jesus suffered for our sins once for all and for all people. So we can be made right with God. But it gets down to do we receive the judgment or do we receive the grace of God? All right, this, is what, this is what this is all about today. It's a symbol. It's a picture. Of, the, of God's love, of Jesus Christ, of his blood shed for many. You can't take a, the human condition out of, out of the equation. We are sinful. God has to deal with our sin. So he deals with it through Jesus Christ. He's the provision. He's the escape. He's the way. If you were to take the, the, the word gospel, G-O-S-P-E-L, and make an acrostic out of it, you, you could put it like this. G, God's. O, only S, Son, P, provided, E, eternal, L, life. God's Son, only Son, provided eternal life. That's the way that life comes. And this testifies as much as anything else about the judgment of God as well as the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it testifies of the necessity of what Jesus did for us. The second thing, it testifies of the importance of personal faith because in these verses, verses 26 and 27, he takes the drink, and he tells him, drink it. He takes the bread, eat it. It had to be eaten. There's an exercise here that's given to us a personal faith. How many times in the scriptures is Jesus talking about eating and drinking? And it always refers to our commitment. 
to following, to personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it always comes down to. Eat my flesh, drink my blood. All it has to do is committing your life to Christ in faith, giving your heart and giving your life to him. Whoever eats my flesh, whoever drinks my blood shall have eternal life. So the eating and the drinking, it's, it's faith in action. I can't deserve any credit for that, all right? Because it's not my faith, really. It's the object of my faith. In fact, Romans says, God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. What am I going to do with this faith? Well, what am I going to trust? Eating in itself. If I just sit down to eat, doesn't guarantee proper nourishment, does it? A lot of emphasis on our health today and what we eat and, you know, all the kinds of organic foods that are available and all the kinds of junk food that's available. And so we have all these, these ideas of what's good food and bad food. I'm sure you're going to get a lot more from that as we get a little deeper into Obamacare, what's good food and what you can't eat and what you can't eat. Amen. But in the context, I can sit down and know I need to eat, but if I'm not eating the right thing, it does me no good. And the same is, if I'm not believing in the right thing, it does me no good. Everybody I know says, well, I have faith. Well, what's your fault? I'm a Muslim, I'm Hindu, I'm Buddhist, I'm Christian. All right. Everybody says they have faith, but what's your faith in? Is it misplaced or is your faith placed in the right place on the right object and the right object is the Lord Jesus Christ? It's Jesus that saves us, not our faith. It's Christ that makes us free. It's Christ that has the power to save, not my faith. So my faith is placed in him and on him. Salvation is the result. The Bible says we're justified by faith. But it gets down, I love what Dr. Joel Beek wrote about this. He says, we are justified not merely by faith, but by faith in Christ. And not because of what faith is, but because of what faith lays hold on and receives. Our faith is in Christ. He's the object. We're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. I have this passage that, well, let me just back that up. Go ahead and back it up one more time. I thought I had this one on here. I've been in Belize trying to send stuff to my computer, and I don't know what got here and what didn't get here, all right? <laughs> Romans 5. You're all familiar with justified by faith passage, and we can stand in the grace of God and rejoice even in our tribulations. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the message Bible. It's, it's all right for a kind of reading as a devotion, but I wouldn't spend my time using it as a study reference. But I did write this down out of Romans 5 from the Message Bible, verses 1 and 2. It says, By entering through faith into what God has, into what God has always wanted us to do for us, it set us right with Him. It makes us fit for Him. We have it all together with God because of our Master, Jesus Christ. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that He has already thrown open His doors to us. And we find ourselves standing where we always hoped we would stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting out our praises. We have something to shout about. What Jesus has done for us has accomplished for us what nothing could ever do. We're living in a world with people running around like hamsters in a cage, spinning on a wheel, going nowhere, think they're making progress, looking for answers to find no answers, don't realize it, but they're stuck in a hamster cage. Beating their head against one wall, nuzzling the way down into the saw flakes, the wood flakes or whatever might be in the bottom of the pen, and there's no answers. There's no freedom and there's no victory. They kind of build a world around themselves where they imagine themselves to be free. It's only when you lift your head up out of selfishness and sinfulness and you look to God and Jesus Christ and you receive him by faith into your life that all of a sudden, the eyes of your understanding are open and you begin to see for the first time what it really means to be free. This is a testimony that is given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ that causes us to go back and remember that. I am nowhere, I have nothing if I don't have Jesus and all that he's done for me. It testifies of the necessity of our own commitment to Jesus Christ. The third thing is another testimony I want to bring forth. It testifies about the promise of the Lord Jesus. What's he say in verse 29? Guys, I'm, I'm not going to do this with you again. Now, I want you to do it. And, and when you do it, remember me. But I'm not going to have this meal with you again. Until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So as you take the Lord's Supper today, remember, there's going to come a day when you're going to sit down with Jesus and you're going to receive it again. 
in remembrance and testimony of him. There's coming a day when those of us who do know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior are caught up in glory and we are seated around the throne of God, seated at the wedding feast, the marriage feast of the Lamb, and we receive this meal together again. What a great day that's going to be. I, I'm one of those weird people that actually believe that kind of stuff. I actually, really, I really do. I don't just say it. I really do believe that there's coming a time when Jesus Christ is going to receive us into his presence. I believe there's going to come that moment, that mysterious moment that the apostle talked about, then that twinkling of an eye, we're going to be caught up in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I'm just crazy enough to believe that. I remember hearing the story about a preacher who got up and preached about all these second coming events, you know, and preaching it with authority and conviction, and there were some theologians there who came up and said, well, you know, Reverend so-and-so, we just, you know, we just can't, We've sought, we've tried, we just can't get that out of there. He said, certainly you can't. It's written by God, it's in there to stay. <laughs> it's the word of God. That passage in Revelation, it says this, as the apostle John is caught up into heaven, he said, he said, then I heard what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd and the roar of a mighty ocean waves and the crash of loud thunder. And these words came, praise the Lord, for the Lord our God is almighty. He reigns. Let us be glad. Let us rejoice. Let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding of Feast of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared herself. She has been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. For the fine linen represents the good deeds of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, write this. Take a note. <laughs> Get this down. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words that come from God. And, uh, you know, this is a moment in, in where, where time no longer exists. This is eternity. And John is brought up into the presence of God where time no longer exists. And he sees all these things taking place. And he sees that moment in time. You know, and if you look carefully, I'm there. You're there. If you're a child of God, right? I mean, this, it's already happening, all right? It's happening. He's seeing it all. And I know, you get to talk to him, you can ask him, do you know where I was seated? <laughs> Am I in the back? Am I in the front? Am I around the side? We're all with Jesus wherever we're seated. That's the beauty of heaven. And so we're there, and John sees it, and he hears these, there's a time of worship, and there's praise. And I mean, he said it's like an ocean wave, thundering sound of God's presence and glory. And he said, I'm just caught up in the moment. And all of a sudden he feels this little tug. Oh, by the way, John, write this down. <laughs> Blessed is everyone who's invited to this event. I am so, so blessed. I got an invitation. I did my RSVP as quick as I could. Count me in. I'm coming. Jesus paid the way. The ticket's been purchased by his blood. Hallelujah. We're going to be there. But I don't want us to miss as we think about this. Jesus said, I'm going to do with you, with this, with you again. But he said, he goes on to tell, the, the angel tells John, hey, blessed is everybody who gets the invitation. And I think what you could even say is like, be sure and invite somebody. This is not a come alone event. Be sure and bring somebody. Be sure and tell somebody. Be sure and get, 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 get after it. You know, a lot of times we get so wrapped up in kind of a social kind of church that we, we'll go to our little events and we have our ladies' meetings and we have our teas and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And the men, we get the wild game feast and we have, the, you know, the barbecue dinner and, you know, have a speaker and we go. But we miss the mark of why we've been going. We're going to bring somebody. You know, the event's a ministry. The, it's not just a, a social gathering. The, the event has a purpose behind it. There's something that should be driving the event, whether it's the, the ladies, you know, brunch or it's the men's dinner or a wild game feast or a retreat, whatever it might be. We're supposed to be including people, inviting people. And all these things are simply means and tools and methods. Hey, we can reach more people. Amen. You know, next time some event comes up, hey, think to yourself, uh, who am I going to bring? Who can I invite? Because blessed is everybody who's invited to this event. And more blessed when they respond. 
The greatest thing anybody will ever do for you, I think what's being said here, is tell you about Jesus. But even greater, the greatest thing happens when you personally trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Don't miss this mark. Blessed is everyone. The Lord's return is this, it's, it's spectacular, it's supernatural, it's incredible, but it's intended to be inclusive. We would fail. How many people, when, when we get to, to heaven, are going, we're going to see in heaven, how many, how many of our friends are going to say, hey, so-and-so is here. You know, I, I told that guy about Jesus, and they're all rejoicing about all the people that are there because, and you're sitting around saying, oh, we, were, we were supposed to invite somebody? <laughs> You'll never have that excuse here, amen? Right. You know what you're supposed to do. But we, like with this meal, comes a time of remembrance. We're going to be gathered there with Jesus. Now, I believe the Lord's in our midst. He's not taking this with us. He will soon when that day comes. But what a day that's going to be. Let's have hearts that are ready. This signifies and it testifies of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's this testimony. Now, that's just a few little points. I mean, there's so many things, and we've said so many different things about communion. But I think those are three points that I feel like the Lord would have us bring out today out of this. Let's receive it. Most important thing is the Bible tells us, the Apostle Paul writes to us, that the Lord tells us to come to this table with clean hearts. Let a man examine himself. What's that have to do with this? If Jesus Christ died to take away our sins, and this is a reminder that my sins should be confessed, then how can I dishonor him more by saying, I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing no matter what God says, because it's what I want to do. He says, you be careful. You approach the table that way. He says, because some of you are sick. And some of you died <laughs> because they didn't honor this remembrance, this time of remembrance. That's why he says, let a man examine himself. Make sure your heart's right with God. Make sure that if there's any sin, that it's confessed. Don't you love the passage of 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. You may know what the rest of that verse says. And to what? Cleanse? Let's, let's say it right. Cleanse us from... From... From, you say, what about something that may be in my heart I don't know about? All unrighteousness. That's, that's spectacular. <laughs> that's incredible. Hey, if you turn the pages, in, in my life I've said it before, it's like opening a book and so is yours, and every day is a new page, amen? Every day is, a, I'm sure if you look down to the next chapter somewhere, you're going to find some blotted ink somewhere. <laughs> but you know what? If I just come in faith and commit my heart to Jesus and if there's an area in my life that's not right, God not only forgives me that sin, he deals with the whole unrighteous issue. I'm right with God. Isn't that the grace of God? How can he do that? He's a just God and he said, I will pay for all the sins because Jesus took the price upon himself. It's all covered. Hallelujah. What a great God we serve. So as we do always right before we see the Lord's Supper, I want us to stand with our heads bowed and give you a moment and me a moment to just... Open our hearts and minds to the Lord. If there's something in my life that's not, not honorable to Christ, if there's something in my life that I've been fighting God on, it's, it's time to lay those things down. It's time to be open and sensitive to the Holy Spirit and let God speak to our hearts. We, we really do one of two things this time. We, we get stubborn and resistant, or we get open and we get yielded. So with our heads bowed, and we're just going to have a, just a simple invitation this morning. If you're a Christian and you know things really aren't right with the Lord, what would hinder you today from just come find a place here in the altar somewhere and just... Get things right with God. There's no reason to carry around. You know, if, if you look what sin is doing in your life, you realize it hasn't brought you any grace, any victory, any peace, any joy. It just hasn't. It never does. There's only pleasure for a moment in sin, and it gets old fast. It's time to lay that down before the Lord today. He's given everything for you. It's time to give it up. Yield it. He'll never take something from you that he is not ready to put something far better that meets the need in your life, if you'll let him. Maybe you're here without Christ today. These men are standing here in this altar with me today. We'd love to share with you how you can know Jesus personally, to come and give your heart and your life to him. Maybe there's some issue you just want to put before the Lord between you and Jesus. Come find a place behind them to pray. Maybe you want somebody to pray for you. You can come to any one of us. We'll pray with you, pray for you. Maybe there's some other area in your life you just need somebody to pray for you, bring someone to the altar with you. That's fine as well. But as we worship quietly the Lord in this moment, just sing this song of worship. Let's just 
let's just do what the Lord's telling us to do here before we receive the Lord's Supper and get our hearts right. You come. We thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for your obedience to the suffering of the cross for us. Don't let us come to this moment without seeing in our own heart and mind the price of Calvary, the price of our sin, that the bleeding, the suffering, the agony of the cross on our behalf. Let us miss how despicable sin is and how beautiful holiness is. Thank you for the grace that you show us through your son Jesus. Wash our hearts, clean us. Only you can make us right. Only you can justify, only you can give us that garment of righteousness. So we look to you and we thank you. Jesus name you may be seated the apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 then the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed he took bread and the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed almost every instance of the Lord's Supper talks about the betrayal of Jesus whether it's in the Gospels or Paul's reference to it here in the moment of commitment there's also a moment of 
of non-commitment. In the moment of grace, there was a moment of ignorance. In the moment of, of beauty and obedience of Jesus, there was this moment of disobedience by foolish heart. Don't let that be us. Don't let this meal be marked by traitorship, so to say. Let me mark by our, our love for Jesus and our appreciation for all that he's done. For he said, as often as you do this, you can do this in remembrance of me. So we come to this meal today. I, these men are coming forward. We'll take the elements and they'll pass them out to you. We'll ask you to take a piece and pass the tray to the next person. As we receive the elements, I ask you just to wait. And as you're waiting, I want you to take notice of the element, this bread that's in your hand and how it's made. It's it's traditional Passover matzah bread. It, according to Levitical law, it had to be made in a very specific manner to be acceptable as worship before the Lord. It had to be baked in a way. It had to be pierced. It had to be grilled in such a way that the mark showed up on it. It had to be unleavened, no hot air reactions, flat bread. All those elements talk of Jesus, who's the bread of life, who was striped and scarred for our sins. He was pierced for our sins. Uh, all laid upon him. He became the sacrifice. This bread, Jesus said, all that he's been given under Moses and the law was a picture of me. Amen. This is my body, he said. So let's reflect on that this morning. As these gentlemen come and pass this tray to you, you pass it to the next. Take time to thank the Lord for his grace, his commitment to you, his mercy, his love. I think most of all, his continual patience. Amen. Christ. 
as you take this bread and as we eat it in a moment after giving thanks, I just want you to tell the Lord, I love you. I remember you. Thank you for changing my life, giving me hope. Lord, we do thank you. As our minds are come back to that place where you stood in that room with those men and gave them that piece of bread, broke it for them, and you told them to eat it. And you explained that this is me, this is my body. Everything that you've heard and understood of God is found in me. Lord, we would take this today in such deep gratitude. Jesus, we remember you. Gratefully, we remember you. And we thank you in your precious name. Would you take and eat? Three words in the English New Testament. In like manner. It says that Jesus took the cup. That manner that he took the bread was a humble manner. Obviously a manner of demonstration of deep, deep love that he had for those men in that room. But as he prayed prior to that, not just for them, John 17, for all of us, he prayed for every one of us. He said that would believe on his name. And then he took that meal with them as though taking it with every one of us. That manner of grace, that manner of humility, that manner, I mean, you're talking about God in flesh, humbling himself for men who, for the most part, had no desire for him. As these gentlemen take and pass this element among you, I want you to take it, and as you did with the bread, just look into that cup and remember the great grace of Jesus Christ in shedding his blood, not just for all men, praise the Lord, but for you.
religious works, not my church attendance, not my Bible reading, not my praying, not my denomination, not my religion, not my code of ethics, not my attitude, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And praise God, we've received that gift that God so graciously outpoured. In like manner, it says Jesus took the cup and after giving thanks, he said, take and drink it. Jesus is in this very moment and he's giving this to his disciples. He says, he gave thanks. He knows everything getting ready to transpire. He knows what Judas is doing in this moment. He knows what's happening in the Sanhedrin's moment. He knows every event that's being conspired by the forces of hell against him. He knows about the nails. He knows about the crown of thorns. He knows about the suffering. He knows about the beatings. He knows about the whip. He knows about the grave. And he knows the worst part of all, him who knew no sin becoming sin. And he gave thanks. What a God. What a Savior. Father, I thank you today for this great gift of your eternal grace in Jesus, your Son. And Jesus, we thank you for this gift of pouring out your life's blood that we might be made whole before you. We give you thanks. We give thanks. In Jesus' name, would you take and drink? Stand with me. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I feel like I've been to church. <laughs> Amen. Walk out of here in revival and praising God for all that he's done for you. Bless his holy name. Amen. A couple of things as we close our service today. If you are a first-time guest, take a moment, stop in the lobby.